Hey everyone, welcome to Triple V, a show dedicated towards advancing the message of a free society. I'm your host, Mike Shanklin. Tonight I'm joined with a real special guest. His name is Stefan Kinsella. He was actually on my show, what's it been, about two months ago. Anyway, I'm going to, I know the live viewers can't see this, but for those going to be on uh, watching the recorded version, you guys can check out the past video right here. Just click on this little link and it'll take you over there and leave this video open as well so you can hopefully check out that original interview and then come back and check out this one. Now, on that last interview, we went over a variety of topics. We Obviously, <laughs> with Kinsella, you'll have to you have to touch on IP intellectual property. We also went over the Ron Paul versus RonPaul.com situation. Uh, Adam Swartz, that was a, uh, a sad scenario. And we talked Aaron, about... Aaron. Aaron, I, I always say Adam. I'm telling you, I don't know what it is. Yeah, Aaron, excuse me. I, I need to get that right. And uh, corporatism, too. So we went over a variety of topics. I wanted to have him back on the show, obviously, to talk about a new niche, new set of, of questions and topics and issues that haven't been touched on, at least on this show. Um, anyway, before we get too deep into it, Stefan, how you doing? I'm good. How, you, how about yourself? I can't complain, man. I'm uh, I, I'm pretty tired. The baby's really... <laughs> Starting to take its toll on me, you know. Uh, for those who don't know, I, I just had a baby about two and a half months ago, and he's awesome, but he's also a handful. But anyway, um, other than that, things have been going pretty good. So, um, you, you know, looking back on it, yeah, I, I want to skip through the whole, you know, what voluntarism is, and you already did all that, so people can check out that past video for that. Tonight, I, I just want to jump right into the topics. Before we can move on to some of the other topics, though, we have to kind of go back to IP real quick because I had a lot of people, obviously, when you come on the show, uh, people are going to ask me questions to ask you about intellectual property. Okay. And, and um, one, of, one of the ones I think is it's a really good question, you know, and, and to some people it might be, oh, this is kind of a foolish question or some kind of like libertarianism 101, but I think it's actually something that uh, more people need to hear the answer to. And that one is asked by Shane Wolf. Shane Wolf asks... How would musicians, artists, et cetera, make money if we abolish intellectual property? So I think questions like that are, are reasonable, understandable, and they're fine. But we, I think we do have to establish ahead of time that a question is not an argument. Okay. So, and, and also, and that's obviously a, a, a good question and an honest one. But quite often I get asked questions more in a rhetorical, smart-ass way. Um, and they don't really want the answer um, to the to the question. They just want to implicitly they so they want to imply something with their question that they're not capable of or willing to make an explicit argument for. Um, so it would be like sometimes it'd be like saying, "Well, in your free market society, you know, how, how am I supposed to uh, get my social security check, or how am I supposed to live when I'm?" when I'm 88 years old and I don't have any money or how am I supposed to get health care if I can't afford it? Um, and quite often those are not sincere or honest questions or they sort of assume something, right? They assume that there's some kind of right to health care or old age provisions, etc. Yeah. Um, so quite often when I get the question, I'm wary of just answering it because they'll just go to the next question. They're never, they're never satisfied. So, for example, they'll say, well, how would authors make money? And I'll give them an I'll say, well, you know, I can't predict what a free market would look like, but here's what I think would happen. But I don't think that my answer – or I don't think our view of IP depends upon the answer because it's a question of justice. Um, so if I answer, well, here's one way authors could make money. So I'll, I'll give an example. I'll give an example. I'll say, well, for example, let's take uh, the author of Harry Potter, the Harry Potter novels, right? Very popular. I think she was the first female billionaire in Britain. <laughs> so she made lots of money off of um, uh, royalties from books and movie deals, probably mostly movie deals and merchandising, etc. So the question is, how would J.K. Rowling make money? So I say to myself, well, in a copyright-free world, she's going to face piracy like she does now, right? There is piracy going on now, people haven't noticed. So <laughs> the question is almost how do you make money in today's world? Um, and the answer is the same that any entrepreneur faces. That's a person who acts and tries to make a profit. You have to look at the world, determine what the future will bring about when you act and whether it will satisfy you in monetary or other terms. And if you think, if you're trying to make money, which people do in some aspects of their lives, you have to find a way to make money. You have to find a way to satisfy consumers. So the smart-ass kind of short and simple answer would be 
produce something people want to buy and sell it. I mean, there's nothing illegal in a free market without copyright about writing and selling a book. You're not, it's not like you can't sell a book. <laughs> um, so the first answer will be write a book and sell it, like on the Kindle platform or something like that. And then the question would be, well, but then how do you stop people from competing with you? And then we get to the real question. So the question is not how do you make money, it's how you stop people from competing with you. But let's get back to the J.K. Rowling example. I've got a blog post on my website, c4saf.org, about this. So I suspect that a J.K. Rowling, she wrote the first, she was a welfare mom. She wrote the novel because she was just entranced by the idea. She had a passion for it. She probably would have written Harry Potter anyway, as she did, because uh, she wasn't hoping to be a billionaire. She didn't think she'd be a multimillionaire. So she sells, she puts the first novel on, let's say she puts it on Amazon on the Kindle store for a dollar a copy, three dollars a copy. Uh, even in a world where people could copy her, well, she would sell some initially because it was a good book and people liked it. And then maybe people start knocking it off and pirating her and I don't know, I guess the pirates would sell it for 25 cents and so she'd have to lower her price to compete with them or maybe people wouldn't mind paying a dollar instead of 25 cents because it's not that much of a savings and if she didn't have a publisher, she could dollar a book is about what authors make anyway after going through the publishing guilds which were set up because of copyright in the first place. Um, so she, she sells the first Harry Potter novel. She makes, I don't know, let's say she makes $20,000 or $100,000 on it, whatever. She becomes popular and there are Harry Potter fans all over the world and guess what? She's got six other Harry Potter novels in her mind that she's ready to, um, to, to write and publish. So she gets in her mind, well, let me do a Kickstarter project or let me go on my, let me start a website called jkrolling.com or harrypotter.com and I'll tell my fans, I've got book number two ready to go. And as soon as I get 100,000 people that commit to pay five bucks each for it, you know, half a million dollars, I'll release it and then I'll sell some on top of that. So now she's got a million dollars. <coughs> then... Two or three companies say, let's make a movie based upon the first book. It's a popular book series. They don't need her permission, <laughs> so they might two or three or four movies come out. Well, even if they come out, they're going to make Harry Potter even more popular so she can make more money on the third book. And one of the companies might come to her, the studios, and might say, listen, if you will agree to authorize or consult on this movie – and we can say it's the authorized version, authorized by the author of the novels, we think we can sell more tickets, right? Because more of your fans, if there's two or three Harry Potter novels, movies coming out at the same time, you know, movies are 10, 15 bucks a piece, they might choose to see the best one, which would be the one that the author authorized. So maybe they'll give her a cut of the royalties. Maybe they'll give her a million, maybe $10 million. That's the first one. So you can see that after seven novels, she might be worth $50 million or maybe $100 million without copyright at all. Uh, so that's one example. But the problem is you give an example like this, and then they'll say, well, what about a poet? What about a painter? What about a sculptor? What about a software programmer? I mean, they just keep coming up with one rat-a-tat machine gun example after the other, um, and they're never going to be satisfied until you give them, I don't know, an answer for every possible question they could have. So basically their, their implicit position is, I want a world where the following goals that I have arbitrarily specified have to be met in any society or are going to be met in your society. So I think there needs to be this percentage of creativity needs to be in movies and blockbusters and Hollywood hits and Kate Winslet being in Titanic and, you know, I mean, Basically, the way it's been has got to be the way it's always got going to be, and I've got to prove that. And I don't think that's going to happen. I think things will change. Um, so long answer to a simple question, but that question I think is often um, a mind trap or disingenuous, or at least we have to be clear that, look, I can answer these questions. I can give a stab at it. And there's other answers, by the way, for uh, inventions and acad oh, look, academic works. I, you and I both write things on Facebook and uh, uh, nonfiction works all the time. We don't get paid for it. We do it because we're interested in doing it. Most scholars do not get paid a cent for their law review articles or their scholarly publications. They do it for the prestige 
and to contribute to the field and to get their reputation, um, to get well known. Some some of them actually pay these journals to publish in the journals. <laughs> so the idea that without the monetary incentive provided by copyright, there would be no, say, non uh, academic writing or no non no scholarly writing is ridiculous. There's no incentive now, financial incentive. Um, from copyright. Copyright actually only hurts them because they often have to assign the copyright to some journal or publishing house or their university and then they don't even have the right to reprint their own works later on. Um, so it restricts how many people can see it. Um, so that would be one answer. And there, by the way, is a lot of case studies and suggestions on techdirt.com and on my site. Um, the problem is that we don't have freedom now and so these people that object to copyright because we can't give them an answer to what a copyright-free world would look like won't let us try a copyright-free world out to see what would happen. Yeah, no, good stuff. And, you know, you brought up guilds earlier talking about how they were actually a result of previous statism. Can you go into the, the history of guilds real quick? And help yeah, well, so, the, in, uh, so one of the classic examples of, well, the origin of modern copyright law was um, in at the with, with, with the you know before the printing press came about, it was really hard to pass down information. So you had oral traditions, and you had these scribes, people who would inscribe or hand copy the Bible and other books. Um, we didn't have a problem of too much copying. We had the the opposite problem, <laughs> um, but they could be controlled a little bit by the church and the state because there was a. a a small number of scribes. Well, then the printing press starts, and then so the government and the church starts freaking out. Uh oh, we might have people reading things we don't want them to read. You know, um, maybe Protestantism will spread, or Catholicism, or or, or I don't know, some other views. Um, so you had this company called the Stationers Company, chartered on oh, fifteen hundreds or something in England, which for I don't know a good hundred or so years had basically a monopoly. It was basically the organization that the church and the crown used to control what books could be printed. So you had to get permission from the stationer's company to print something because you had to go through a printer to print things back in those days. So the government had an easy way to, to control this. Well, when their patent or monopoly ran out, um, at that point, uh, the stationer's company was lobbying parliament. This is in the late 1600s, early 1700s. Uh, to uh, give them their monopoly, to to renew their monopoly, so there was a but there were some you know people were concerned about this. So what happened was the 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 publishing industry lobbied Parliament to pass the Statute of Anne, 1709, which was the origin of modern copyright, and they did it under the guise of giving authors a copyright. Okay. By the way, this the history of all this is fascinating, and you can find it on a website called questioncopyright.org. Just go there and look on one of their pages. They have a whole history of all this. Um, so what the, the publishing industry realized was that they could, under the guise of, of getting Parliament to grant a copyright to authors, which everyone thought was a good thing, oh, let's give it to the authors now. They, or they write the books. They should have the right. They knew that the authors would have to go right back to the publishing companies to get it published, and they, and they would get the chokehold on it again. So you had emerging right after the stationer's company's charter and monopoly expired, you had a, 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 a statute enacted allegedly in the name of authors, but really what it did was it allowed the publishing industry to come back in again and assume control again. This is why even to this day, although the internet and Amazon is starting to break this monopoly down, even to this day most authors have their copyrights locked up by some publishing company. So it's just like the guild all over again. So it looks – it's just like inventors at, at companies. Everyone says, oh, you need patents to protect the small inventor. Well, that's nonsense. Most patents are kept by big companies, mm -hmm. oligopolistic corporations, and we, if you're an employee working for one of them, you have to assign your rights over to them as part of your employment agree agreement. So it's, 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 it's again, the same thing. It's, it's just a disguised way of keeping these uh, monopolies and these kind of guild-like systems uh, perpetuate it. And, and the irony is that um, one reason, one way that the copyright system was sold to the public and to the authors 
was by telling them up till now the government, the crown, the church, the guilds have been able to decide whether your book was going to be published so they could censor you. Well, under the new copyright system, you will have that right. In other words, they sold it to the authors, not telling them, you're going to have a monopoly on this. You'll be able to stop people from publishing your works. But they're telling them, we're going to liberate you. We're going to let you be free of censorship and have the right to publish your stuff yourself. And of course, it's turned around again into another censoring tool because now authors will, or their publishing agents will sue people for copying their stuff. And by the way, something similar happened with patents. One reason the patent system, which was had its origin in around 1623 with the um, statute of monopolies, they actually called it that <laughs> uh, in England. And it's funny, yeah, you have advocates of the patent system now who get indignant when you call it a monopoly. How dare you call what I'm in favor of a monopoly? It's like, oh, I don't know. How about 1623 statute of monopolies? <laughs> but one way they sold that was, again, they told people there, – there was a complex system of guilds which had these quasi-monopolistic controls over who could be in what trade and what goods could be sold in a certain town or region. And the idea of the, of the statute of monopolies and the patent system was the government would come in and give you a patent over this which would kind of give you permission to make this good at least. It was a way of breaking the, the stranglehold on, of the guilds. So even the patent system was sold originally in part as a way to break the previous system of censorship and monopolies and anti-competitive controls of a kind of quasi-state um, arrangement. And of course, both have turned out to be exactly um, what they purported to be fighting against yeah <laughs> it's all double speak in the end anyway I mean good stuff I mean I, we, people need to hear that stuff uh, let's let's move on from IP I don't want to have a you know we already have a whole video on IP so let's hit on a, a variety of different topics David Laverne wants me to ask you how is the government going to collect the sales tax from the internet revenue or from the ever, internet uh, sales tax they're talking about uh, how, how could government enforce an internet sales tax if it was to go into effect other than like because you would think you know we're going to be as as time goes on more and more we're going to be doing business more globally than we are just locally so it's not like going to be just me in California I might buy something from Canada or England or uh, name a country you know what I'm saying right. anywhere I mean how 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 do you see the uh, the internet either ha helping us reduce our tax burden or do you think it can be controlled I want to hear your opinion on this well of course I'm totally against any state and any taxation whatsoever anywhere, and I'm not even – I mean I, I, there is an issue of the discriminatory effect. The, the fact that the internet is largely unregulated right now and permits, say, Amazon sales to largely be – you know, to escape sales tax, um, it, it does penalize to some degree um, brick-and-mortar stores which have to pay sales tax, but of course the penalty is the sales tax that they're subject to. And the solution is not to tax unregulated and untaxed industries. It's to free up the others. Um, so the proposals I've heard, in the U.S. at least, would be for um, – I don't think the federal government is right now seriously proposing doing that, although it's been mis mischaracterized as that. I think the federal government is proposing changing a federal law, which I think temporarily restricted the states from imposing – sales taxes. Um, so I think the states, a lot of them want to impose sales taxes for obvious reasons. Sometimes they're being lobbied by the brick and mortar stores so that they have a more level playing field. Sometimes they just want the money. Um, so uh, I don't know, m maybe most people are not familiar with this, but in most states in the U.S., if you buy a good on Amazon, let's say, or from an online merchant from another state and it's shipped to you and your home, uh, if you don't pay sales tax, then the reason is because the sale did not, quote, take place in your home state. So your state has no jurisdiction over the seller, okay? But they still do have jurisdiction over you. So there's usually in most states a corresponding what they call a use tax. So what you're supposed to do, let's say you live in California and you get a shipment from a Texas company and you, you, you receive a hundred dollar item and you don't pay the nine percent or whatever sales tax in California, 
because the, the seller is not complying with California law because they're not subject to their jurisdiction. You are supposed to, as a consumer, report on your state income tax that year <laughs> that you bought this $100 item and voluntarily divulged the, the cost and pay a use tax to California. <laughs> now, California and Texas can't both tax the same transaction because of the interstate commerce clause in the federal constitution, which prohibits double taxation. They have to allocate it or prorate it somehow, but just the basic rule they've adopted. So technically, actually what I would like to see is every politician who's running for office, I would like them to be asked when they have these debates, have you ever reported a use tax on your state income tax return? Because no one does it. <laughs> so they're all evading taxes. So they're basically violating the law, which I think is perfectly fine for for law-abiding non-politicians. But I think politicians ought to be um, completely exposed and, uh, and even penalized for not complying with the state laws of the state that they support. Um, so I think just like the use tax is hard to enforce, I think that uh, enacting a sales tax on online transactions would also be difficult for the states to enforce. I think they would initially try to do it similar to um, the use tax, like they'd say you have to fill out fill it out on your annual state income tax return, or they might start uh, approaching the, the the online companies and say if you have a presence in our state, which would be a website which anyone can access, then you must comply with our law and you must collect the sales tax for us and submit it. Some companies are going to comply, some are not, especially the ones out overseas. So. Uh, what you're going to have, I think, is if it gets too high and too many companies start complying, other companies will emerge that are basically gray market or black market, or they start using Bitcoin or other anonymous transactions the government can't track. So you're going to have like uh, a flight into anonymous or untrackable wet ways of doing commerce, which is not good for the consumer because it, it's less reliable, it's more costly in a, in a sense, right? Yeah. Um, but they'll do what they have to do to uh, evade high sales taxes. I I hope and I believe. Yeah, well, well, we'll, we'll see how that works. I mean, let's uh, before we get too much deeper on this, I ha I have to ask you this question because I've never really asked you this before. What's your whole take on voting? What What do you say to people when they say, "Who are you going to vote for this election?" Um, <laughs> I don't vote, and um, I think it's a waste of time. I I don't quite agree with some of the more ardent libertarians who thinks it's um, immoral to vote. I think if you want to vote, it's fine, although I do think if you vote for you know, evil socialist, that is immoral. But if you just try to get the lesser evil into office, I can understand why people do that. Um, but I think it's completely futile, and I don't think changing the – look, the state is an organization that exists independent of the current administration and the people that – fulfill its role. It exists for a certain reason. It exists because uh, of a certain fictitious belief on the part of the population, the great mass of the population. And they have that belief in part because of state propaganda and because the state has wormed its way into our lives, taken over all the institutions like um, communication, education, uh, the, the academy, you know, academia, uh, security, justice, law, even language in some cases. So it's kind of a weird feedback loop, but I don't think changing the actual individuals who occupy the current administration, or as they say in, in, in outside the U.S., the government, I don't think that's the solution to the problem. The, the, the organization or the entity known as the state uh, will, will, will subsist and will continue. So I don't think going trying to vote to change these fairly – non-distinguishable current politicians who serve roles in the administration is is ever going to solve uh, anything. Although I can appreciate why people get sort of impatient and want to try that. So I think it's futile. Um, I think it's not the solution. I don't know if there is a solution. I mean, I don't think we should only be for liberty if we delude ourselves into believing that we're going to achieve complete liberty forever, once and for all, in the next five years. <laughs> right. You know, even if we achieve liberty in five years, 
I mean, maybe the state will come back. I mean, you know, you, so it, if if you're the type of person who's going to give up and not be for liberty, if if you stamp your foot and you can't be assured by some activists that you're going to have liberty, you know, in two or three years or five or ten, fifteen years, then you know, I don't think you're that good of an ally anyway. And you're not going to stick with it. You're going to give up and go into the darkness. Uh, I fight for liberty because I think it's the right thing to do. I want to understand justice and rights. Um, I do think we're going to have you, you can have liberty in your life in certain ways. You can be aware of the state. I view the state as a dangerous animal. It's like a disease or a tornado or a natural disaster or, or the unfortunate fact of immortality, I mean mortality or or the fact of criminals. These things exist in life and your your job as a surviving human actor is to try to flourish and try to be aware of the dangers and to try to find a way to prosper despite the, these things. And I think that's true of the state as well. It doesn't mean you're endorsing it. It doesn't mean you're giving up. It just means you're being realistic. So there are ways you can take – You know, look, the state is a slow, stupid beast. It's pervasive, and it's dangerous, and it's easier to destroy than to create in a sense, right? Um, so that's my take on voting. Do it if you want to. But I don't think you have any obligation to, and I don't think it's going to do any good. No, good stuff. And you were just mentioning the justice system. Um, you know, I think that's what we're all trying to search for, for what we believe is justice. Maybe, we, you know, that's a whole uh, rhetorical and etymological discussion we could have a different day. But James Cox, you know, this guy, he's, he's, always, he's been fighting for FIJA down over in the uh, yes. in a Florida Fully Informed Jury Association, uh, which I, w I would encourage everybody to go check out, FIJA.org. Yeah, I think it was on his blog his podcast, sorry, a few years ago too. Yeah, well, actually, he he just went up to New York City with me a couple of days ago when I gave my speech up there in uh, at Anarchy and NYC. But he's he's been a friend of mine for years. Anyway, um, he had a bunch of great questions uh, pertaining to the court system, mm -hmm. and it's pretty in depth. But let's let's jump right into it. All right. Uh, one of the things he wants to ask <coughs> is, what changes would you like to see in today's court system? An example he has is like. Judges having less power in the courtrooms. Uh, he says maybe they're just referees and not as, as much as authoritarians. One other thing he said was maybe attorneys should not have to be a part of the bar association, and they could have their uh, and have their jobs dictated by this association. You, you know, maybe we can hammer on that yeah, before we sure. jump into the other things. Yeah, let, let's talk about a few things. Well, first of all, again, I, I think we have to be honest and and recognize the nature of what we're dealing with here. One change we can make is to not call them courts and judges because they're not courts and they're not judges. They are fake courts and they're fake judges. These are just employees of the government pretending to administer justice and law. They do that to have a veneer or a veneer or a patina of respectability to have some legitimacy behind their rulings, but they're all just government goons. So that's one thing we can do. Comply with their orders to avoid physical harm if you you have to, but don't delude yourself into respecting them. Uh, if they make if they make you call them your honor, you know, go through the motions, do what you have to do. But first of all, let's recognize them for what they are. They're not real judges. They're not administering real law. They're not real courts. Um, a real court would be private. It would be to settle a dispute between two actual people based upon principles of justice developed in a private law setting, not uh, some guy that was appointed by a governor. Or elected in a, an election who has the power to enforce the arbitrary decrees and dictates of another branch of the government, the legislature, which are called legislation or statutes. Um, the idea that the idea of justice is to try to do justice in a dispute between two parties. Two people have a real dispute. They both claim the same thing: who gets this truck, right? Or this guy hurt me. How much of his money do I get? Or how much of his money does he need? Does he get to keep? That's a real dispute, and a fair-minded person, an impartial jury, or a judge, or an arbitrator, or whatever, can try to at least find the answer to the question: Who is the rightful owner of this property? But that is not what judges today do, because the vast bulk of law, so-called law, is just statutes that are en enacted arbitrarily by a legislature, which don't have anything to do with justice. Um, and so the job of the judge nowadays, and I feel sorry for these so-called judges because their job is to interpret statutes, which is basically the job of an English professor or a lexicographer. 
So the, the question before the judge is not what's the just result. That's never the question anymore, or very rarely. The question is what does this word mean in the statute that the government passed? So for example, if the statute says you shall go to jail for 10 years if you sell cocaine, so then the only question is – or a controlled substance, let's say. So the only question is what's a controlled substance? So then you go look at another – list of definitions by another agency of the government which defines the current list of controlled substances and then the only question is well did this guy sell a controlled substance and if the answer is yes then he's got to go to jail for 10 years or 15 years or life so that's not so he's got to go to jail and you have to you have to come up with an answer whether it's just or not so that's my first thing i would recognize these as criminal organizations that have almost nothing to do with justice anymore and it's not the judge's fault. The judges are trying to they're just they're doing what they're told, but you know, on the other hand, uh, they're just following orders, right? Uh, but if you want to talk about real changes, I would say a couple of things. I do agree that it would be better if lawyers didn't have to um, um, be a member of the bar or swear an oath to the court. Although, to be honest, as much as I don't like lawyers, I mean, I don't like engineers. I mean, there you know, there are too many socialists in all of them. Lawyers tend to be pretty good defenders of civil liberties when it when push comes to shove. And think of the ACLU, for example. I mean, I'm not a liberal, but I do admire the ACLU for standing up to for civil liberties. And a lot of lawyers do that. Right. Um, in fact, a lot of the complaints people make about lawyers, and I am one, um, I understand, but I would say nine times out of ten, it's the clients that are the jerks, not the lawyers. The clients insist on going to trial and suing someone standing on their rights when their lawyers are saying, listen, can we just settle this? You really don't want to do this. No, damn it. I don't care if I spend 100000 on your fees to get 100000 from this guy. I'm going to make him pay. I mean, so usually it's, it's jerk clients who make lawyers look bad. Um, but that change I don't think would make a big change. If I could just say two things I would change. Number one, I would change the legal system not to a loser pays rule. A lot of people have said we should adopt the um, the English rule, the loser pays rule. Actually, it's the non-American rule. Most countries have a rule more similar to the English rule where the loser pays. I actually don't agree with loser pays because if you are the losing defendant, then that just doubles or, or amplifies the amount of damage you could suffer. Like if a big company sues you for copyright infringement or patent infringement, now you not only – or jeopardy of losing the lawsuit, but of having to pay the attorney's fees. So that makes it even easier for people to engage in legal bullying. So I would institute a rule, the losing plaintiff pays. What that means is if you ever institute a lawsuit, which I regard in almost every case as an act of aggression, um, no matter what the cause of action, because you're using the, the criminal court system of the criminal state. Um, by criminal, I mean it's unjust, not that it's the criminal courts. I mean you're using the court system of a, of a criminal gang of thugs. Um, even if you have a legitimate dispute, I would say it would be better to go to a private arbitrator. So I would say if anyone ever sues anyone else for anything, even a contract breach, and you lose, you have to pay the, the attorney's fees for the, for, the, for the side that you sued because they didn't ask to be drawn into court. So that would be um, – That'd be one change, I think. And then the other would, of course, be the, the, the FIJA idea, the fully informed jury amendment. I do believe people should be made aware by the judge or by leaflets or by some kind of regular institutionalized or other information of their right to nullify any law they disagree with on any grounds whatsoever. So you know, they, they can acquit a defendant of a criminal um, a prosecution. Uh, even if they think he did the crime, um, it, even if even if even if they think the law is constitutional, as long as you disagree with the with the verdict, you can acquit the guy, and then ju double jeopardy should apply. So I would say fully informed jury and jury nullification combined with a, a, a losing plaintiff pays rule would be improvements. Yeah, it would obviously incentivize people to only bring real cases to the to the system. But anyway, good stuff. It, it was funny too because my next question was, "Do you believe that jurors should be educated on their rights?" <laughs> so good stuff. Uh, you know, James Cox did have a couple more questions. I want to ask this one real quick. Sure. Why is freedom of speech controlled in the courtroom? Why can't you say what you want to say? 
That's what James well, Conte does. I, I think the reason, well, there's there's a cynical reason, which is because the judges are little, kind of little fascist dictators in their courtrooms. They kind of have carte blanche. I mean, they can actually sentence people to jail with no, uh, with no uh, due process whatsoever uh, for contempt of court and things like that. So, of course, they become power. They, they do what people do when they're given lots of power. They abuse it. Um, or use it, you could say. I don't even know if it's abuse. It's just the way people act when they're given power. Right. Just like Lord of the Rings, right? That's one yep. problem with power. I mean, I, look, I'm an anarcho-Austrian capitalist. I don't know if I'd make a good president, much less someone like um, your typical run-of-the-mill politician. I'm, if you put any, any of us in the position of controlling a $16 trillion or $4 trillion a year government, I mean, it's hard to resist not using it, giving out jobs and harming your enemies. I mean, what else are you going to do with the power? I don't know what the objectively right thing to do with such power is. Um, so, um, uh, sorry, where am I? What was the question? Uh, that one was freedom of speech in the courtroom. Why oh, can't you do what you want? Yeah, so that's a cynical answer. I think the real answer, though, is there are rules of evidence and procedure in any um, – in, in a real court, in a real judicial proceeding, uh, there would be – tend to be rules of evidence and rules of procedure, which, which is where the idea of due process comes from. And, of course, the modern courts mimic this to make it look like they're just, right, to give their rulings a veneer of legitimacy. Uh, but even in a, in, a, in a real just society, I think there would be rules of evidence, and that would, that would, that would require some limits – on what could be said, it would it would it would prevent some information from being shown to the jury because it's inflammatory or it's irrelevant or it's likely to confuse them or to mislead them. Uh, although my tendency as a libertarian is to have a very low threshold for what's material or relevant for the jury to see, I tend to think you pick a jury at random, like out of the phone book, literally, and you don't disqualify anyone unless they basically know someone. Or have an obvious bias, um, so I would get rid of the. That's another thing I would change too. Back on the other question, I would get rid of the ability of the lawyers and the judge to disqualify jurors um, based upon all the litany of reasons they can disqualify them for that. I mean, you have to get a hundred jurors for some trials to get down to twelve, or maybe even more, because there's so many peremptory challenges or challenges for cause um, that lawyers can use. So each one gets a certain number of like just arbitrary challenges. Challenges, except it can't be for the wrong reasons. It can't be for race or whatever. So maybe I can disqualify six jurors for free, and then I can disqualify as many as I want if I can show cause, which is, you know, any slightly <laughs> unapproved opinion. Like it's like any, it's like probable cause with a police officer. It's uh, similar. Yeah, yeah, it's similar. So the judge or the or the lawyers can disqualify jurors for cause, or they can disqualify. The, for no cause, using up their peremptory challenges. I think that's what they call it. Uh, I would get rid of that because it, I think if you're going to use a jury, it should just be a random selection of people. As long as they're a peer and they're not obviously biased, that's it. The first 12 or the first six or whatever um, you know, should, should get on the jury. So that, that'd be one change I, I would make to the, to the jury system. Uh, and that would also help with the jury nullification problem because they, they, of course, disqualify you if you Say you're aware of the right to nullify if you believe in <laughs> I that. I know. It's, it's a, you have the pamphlet. It's like get out of this courtroom, right? All right. Um, let's move on. Michael Dano, he's awesome, man. I love this guy. He, he wants me to ask you, you know, given the uh, the martial law pol police state down in, in Boston, what's what's the possibility of this just continuing? You know, I personally believe that you know you're just going to continue to see statism grow and grow and grow for years and years and years. I don't think we're anywhere close to a free society or even like on the on the bull trap of it, you know. So um, what I'm what I'm I guess what I'm trying to say is, do you see this police state and that the way that that martial law was enforced in Boston becoming the norm for other regions inside of uh, not only America but the rest of the world? Obviously, it already happens in a lot of places in the rest of the world. But what about specifically America? I, I may not be as pessimistic or as I don't know, say paranoid as a lot of my fellow libertarians. I mean, I hate the state. Um, I hate what it does to us. Uh, I think in some ways it's getting worse. In some ways it's getting better. Not the state, but society. Right. Um, and I think maybe that's the way it's always been. I think there's always a balance, or at least in our Western 
tradition, there's always been a balance. Um, so I'm very nervous about the state getting worse in some ways. Taxes going up, uh, inflation skyrocketing, the police state getting worse, the Constitution being increasingly disregarded. More war. Yeah, yeah or, or war, but I'm also hopeful that, um, um, I mean, there's more libertarians than ever. There's more people aware than ever of the problems with having a completely totalitarian and centralized economy. You know, Mises used to say, like, how can you tell whether you have a free economy? And I think he had a, like a, um, he said basically if you have a stock market, a functioning yeah. stock market. So it's kind of like a, a rough uh, test, right? Uh, a rule of thumb. And another one of my friends, um, I think it was Tim Swanson, uh, said the other day to me, um, he lives in China right now, and he says, you know, you can tell if you have an essentially free or an essentially kind of police state econ of society by whether or not you can get on Facebook without using a, 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 a VPN, okay? And in China, you have to quite often use a virtual private network and some encryption. You basically have to break the law to go on Facebook. And here, <laughs> we don't have to. So in a sense, there's a certain tradition of freedom of speech, and even some Randians used to say this. They said that it's not time to fight physically yet so long as we have freedom of speech because as long as we have freedom of speech, you can at least say and protest what the government's doing. But when they, when they stop freedom of speech, then you have nothing – you have no alternative but to physically fight. Now, of course, they can ratchet it up. They can increase taxes and controls insidiously in a fascist-like manner so that they gradually do that anyway. But to be honest, my hope is, and I'm, I'm trying not to be a Pollyanna, but my hope is that the technology and the free market are so – have so much possibility and can keep growing in ways that are unpredictable to the state and will allow people to um, – I mean, look, technology helps the government and it helps the people. I think it helps the people more, at least nowadays. I think the internet has helped the people more than it's helped the state. And the state's always way behind, right? So I'm hoping that – I mean, look, if they would have known that the, inter the internet would have turned into what it's turned into and cell phones and smartphones and, and, and video cameras, they would have outlawed it a long time ago. But now it's probably too late. Yeah. So that's my hope. Um, so I'm cautiously optimistic. I don't think we'll, we'll get to a point for a long time that we've won or that we've totally lost. Uh, I think it's going to be a balance for a long time, and hopefully <laughs> – during that time, prosperity will keep increasing. Unfortunately, the state will have more to parasite off of and have more resources to fight its wars and to put people in, you know, <laughs> in cages for smoking marijuana and cocaine. Yeah. Um, but people can also find ways to live flourishing good lives despite the unfortunate background cost of the state. Right. So I'm cautiously optimistic and hopeful in the liberty movement and in technology and free market, the power of free markets. Yeah, well, you know, technological advancement got us out of the Malthusian trap, but at the same time, it gave government a an A-bomb and a, you know, a hydrogen yes. bomb. So, yes. you know, we, you know I, I'm feeling you on that. You know, let's, in fact, let's take this to the next step. Uh, if we're going to use this on maybe the side, I don't know which side, if you like these things or not, cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, Litecoin, that's technological advancement technically, and it's a way to avoid taxation. You know, obviously we have the industrial use argument and all the rest of that stuff, which you could argue FRNs have. What know, do you mean the industrial the industrial use argument? Well, like you gold, the, the idea that money has to come from a commodity. Exactly. You know, I'm right. just going over that argument. Right. Um, but you know, and, and obviously Bitcoin's value, technically, it's if you want to call it intrinsic industrial use value. Because uh, nothing has real intrinsic value, but I know they're meaning industrial use when they say that. It's technically zero, right? So technically, the price could fall to zero tomorrow. Uh, people aren't using it to turn bitcoins into, uh, you know, connectors on cables to to increase conductivity, right? So, <laughs> I mean, they they don't have a use for jewelry. Correct. But at the same time, bitcoins can help you avoid taxation and save money yes. too. At the same time, so what, what, I want to hear your whole Bitcoin Litecoin thing. In fact, uh, somebody here who was it, uh, Adam? I want to get his name right. Deisterhoft. Please, I hope I got that right. He actually asks, he wants to hear your short-term and long-term beliefs for Bitcoin and, and Litecoin. Sure. And also, um, you know, are you a fan of them? I'm definitely a fan. 
Uh, I, I do not consider myself to be an expert on this. I, it's one thing I'm trying to learn about. I, I, I know several people who know a lot more than me about it, like Peter Serta, uh, Jeff Tucker even, um, yeah. Vijay Boyapati, Coin Swinkles, friends of mine all. Um, I've been learning about it, reading about it. It's complicated. I mean, I have an electrical engineering degree, and I'm still trying to understand exactly what happens with the, the scheme of Bitcoin. But so far as I understand it, I think the inventor of it, if it's one inventor, um, is a complete genius and what he's come up with. Um, so, so first of all, I, I understand what you're saying about intrinsic value, but the thing about traditional views of money is it's not that it has intrinsic value, it has a non-monetary value. So gold was a commodity that had a commodity value like in a barter economy. It had some value. And that's the Mises regression theorem. It's like right, right. imagine gold having a use for jewelry or industrial uses or ornamentation. And so then it's because of its properties, malleability, it's not too plentiful, not too rare, etc. cetera. Uh, people started using it as an indirect medium of exchange, and then it became in general use. That's money, a general, generally used medium of exchange. Right. Um, I have honestly, I've never quite believed that that is a proof that that's the only way money can arise. In fact, I don't believe it. I mean, maybe I can be convinced of it, but uh, I see no reason it has to be that way. And in fact, what people think of as money now is fiat, say U.S. dollars, which are not – they have no non-monetary value either. They have no commodity value. Now, they came from a gold system, so there's a regression kind of causal histor historical path you could trace back. But dollars could fall to zero value tomorrow too, I guess. I mean it's just the federal government that makes them the most popular thing around because they – impose sales taxes on well, you know, anything here, else. Here's one thing. Every time I, I talk about this, uh, people will say, well, technically the U.S. or any FRN or fiat currency is has an intrinsic value in that you have to pay taxes in it so that you have to get those dollar bills to pay the taxes in it. But then I argue, well, what if we switch over to, because, you know, like Bitcoin's like a commodity currency. It's kind of like a mixture. So yeah. what if everybody switched over to Bitcoin? Well, then nobody would have FRNs, and then it would have no industrial use, you know, regression theorem argument. Yeah, so, I, I, yeah, I think that, I, I think the another problem with that is, I mean, look, theoretically, ever since, I think gold, um, uh, if, I recall, if I recall the history in the 30s, Roosevelt, um, outlawed gold clauses in contracts, but I think, right. oh, there was some time later in the 70s or something that they were re-legalized. So there's nothing preventing you from having, a, from like doing your transactions denominated in gold. So you theoretically could just use gold throughout the year and then convert the gold into the, the current fair market value of dollars to pay your taxes if you wanted to. There's nothing preventing you uh, from doing that. Um, so here's my thinking about Bitcoin. I'm not sure Bitcoin ever would have uh, originated if not for the state because one of the main purposes is anonymity, right, from, the, from government regulation, controls, taxation, outlawing of certain acts like pornography and gambling, online gambling, this kind of stuff. So I'm not sure that there ever would have been a need on a free market for a Bitcoin to even emerge, but the government has created that need, and given that that need is there and given that it has emerged… Um, I think it's a type of money already. I don't think it's the only money, but you know, the dollar's not the only money either. There's francs, and there's, I mean, yeah, that's right, not francs. There's, yeah. gone. there's euros, euros and um, uh, the yen and uh, rubles, yeah. the rubles, etc. Um, so uh, I am cautiously optimistic. I had, a, but one reason I'm not the best person to ask about this, I had a bet with my friend VJ about this. I bet a year ago, well, nine months ago, I bet him that Bitcoin would crash. And my my bet was not because I think it's it can't be a money. It was I thought the government would crack down on it and ruin it, or that people would predict that was going to happen, and so then they would lose faith in it and they wouldn't use it. Right. Um, so I bet him, I don't remember how much, but I ended up paying off early. I said, listen, I'm going to lose this bet, so let, let me give you <laughs> I tell you what, can I get? Can I pay you with a discount if I pay you early? Assuming I'm going to lose in three months. He said, "Yeah, give me, give me three bitcoins." So I had to go buy the bitcoins, and and by go. the time I gave them to him, it, it was worth more than the original bet because they'd gone up so much. So uh, yeah. I lost the bet actually, but it wasn't because I'm against them, and it wasn't because I think they can't be money. It was just because of skepticism about the state. I'm still, I'm still skeptical. I think that if they become too popular and threaten the dollar, 
the government would take out all stops to try to stop it. Um, whether they can succeed or not, I don't know, and maybe they'll be too late. So I'm cautiously optimistic. I, I have some Bitcoins right now, let me put it that way, just as a hedge against the future. So right. I think they have I think there it's I think it's, it could it could replace PayPal and Visa and MasterCard and credit cards as at least as a decentralized costless anonymous payment system or very low cost payment system. Right. So it has the potential to do that. Plus I think I've heard that Bitcoin could be extended for other uses. So it could be used uh, for tracking title to property, real property or even uh, movable property, watches and cars, um, stock, who owns stock in a company that can be used to let you have anonymous ownership interest in a company um, or at least a better tracking system. So it's got lots of uses because the only reason we call it money is because it's called Bitcoin. That's just the yeah. name that was slapped on it, but it's right. just like a little, it's just a ledger. It's just a correlation system. Yeah. You correlate anything. So I think it's fascinating and I, I'm watching it cautiously optimistically I think it's good anything that threatens the state is, uh, is is something I'm in favor of yeah and it's market cap right now I think it's around 1.7 billion dollars which when you think about you know as far as wealth in, in the United States it's like 0 0.008 percent of the wealth so that just gives you an idea of how much uh, room Bitcoin does have to grow and yeah. ad and adopt, uh, you know, into the uh, and permeate into society. Really, uh, let's move on. Franklin uh, Nicole Voluntarist wants me to ask you. Actually, she has a statement. She says it's been a few years since you spoke with Stefan <laughs> since you spoke with Stefan Molyneux about uh, his children's Montessori education. I'm kind of I don't know too much about the scenario, so you, you might have to fill me in too. What are his thoughts now, and uh, what well, your thoughts now, and would you encourage other peaceful parents to have their children uh, be Montessori educated? And do you have any articles talking about the subject? Okay, good question. Um, I think it was a couple of years ago. Stefan Molyneux did um, a series of interviews with people. I think he talked to me, David Friedman, who was a, a so-called unschooler. He talked with me more about Montessori. And, hold on, uh, hold on. You're telling me David Friedman's an unschooler? Yeah. Are you serious? Well, he unschooled, he unschooled his son, Patrick Friedman, apparently. Wow. And his other child, did, I think. Well, do you mean homeschool or unschooled? Unschooled. So it's homeschooling, but like with no curriculum or something. I'm not an unschooler, yeah. so. Yeah, 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 gotcha. Go ahead. Um, and so uh, I did write an article on lewrockwell.com. It's on my website, stephankinsella.com. It's on Montessori and Peaceful well, I didn't call it peaceful parenting at the time. That's sort of a, 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 a name that's I've become more aware of in the intervening years. In fact, I saw Stefan Molyneux about two a month or two ago at uh, this uh, conference we both spoke at in Nagadoches, Texas. It's on my blog. Um, one of my recent podcasts is called. Um, uh, it was my speech on Locke. It was a, a conference called Liberty in the Pines, and at the panel discussion with Jeff Tucker, me, Stefan, and um, three other people, there was a lot of intense interest in the audience. They kept asking over and over again about peaceful parenting and this kind of stuff. So this thing is caught on. People are interested in it. Right. Um, my view is I, I think it's a little bit unfortunate that most of the, the, the libertarians who are interested in peaceful parenting don't know much about Montessori because it's almost like they're reinventing the wheel. They're doing a lot of things sort of by intuition or rediscovery that Montessori figured out a hundred years ago. Right. She was she believed uh, in the way to you know fix our problems for the future is exactly what Molyneux talks about, which is you have to train a new new generation of children who are going to grow up and they're going to become the next leaders um, in in peace, in volunteerism, that kind of stuff. Right. She, you know, I've I, I've got a, something in my article about this. Um, but she had a systematic way, and also they also had a uh, – and by the way, Ayn Rand used to promote Montessori heavily, um, which is one reason I steered clear of it originally because <laughs> I, was, I used to be a Randian, you know, and I still am in some ways. And I was childless and a student, so I didn't really pay much attention to – I didn't give a damn about education techniques of children because I was a 25-year-old smartass. Um, yeah. But – I had this vague idea that it was just some weird, kooky, oddball education system that the Randians like. So by the time I, 
I had uh, children. I there was a Montessori school around where I lived, and I I thought that's what those weird Randians like. But I looked into it and I started falling in love with it because it's so rational and it's so oriented on the kid. And to me, it's just the perfect blend. I love Montessori, at least AMI. Uh, that's the original um, Italian European version, sort of like the Catholics versus the Protestants. <laughs> gotcha. It, it is because in in America, the um, there was this hit piece done in the twenties, nineteen twenties, by some guy who had it out for Montessori, and everyone sort of bought it, and it fell into disfavor here. And later on, it was it was exposed as sort of a just a cro of a crock. But by then, the damage had been done, so there was basically no movement here. So people that were interested in it, this woman named Nancy Rambush went to Europe, and she fell in love with it, and she wanted to. So she started the American Montessori Society because it was she had to do it on her own here. So you had this sort of, but she came up with her own Americanized version of the rules. So that's what happened over here, and now AMI is coming back. So I'd say the majority of schools over here are AMS. But some are AMI, and I, from what I've seen, I like it better, uh, although both are pretty good. The problem is it's not really regulated by any central organization, so you have a lot of so-called Montessori schools. They just call themselves Montessori, but they have almost no rigorous background or training whatsoever. So you've got to do your research. Make sure they're either AMS or AMI certified. So I do like it. Uh, I'm not opposed to homeschooling. I think that's fine. I do believe in the division of labor, so I, I tend to think that uh, – Hiring trained teachers is better, but I know a lot of unschoolers and homeschoolers uh, don't agree on that. But anyway, that's my take on it. I do, I do think it's they're both great, though. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, one, one last question. I'll let you go after that. Sure. Sorry. <laughs> All right, and you know, you and I, we kind of had this discussion earlier. Speaking of which, Mr. Winzel. Anyway, <laughs> that was some good stuff. I heard no, your no, uh, interview. No, be nice. Yeah, I'm gonna be. I'm, I'm a nice guy. Don't worry. Don't no, worry I about said it. Nice. Sorry. Oh, like <laughs> no, I, get, I got you. Well, yeah. Well, you know, that, I guess that's his real name. You know, he's got so many aliases. Nothing really matters as far as the aliases go. He can call himself, you know, Santa Claus for all I care. But um, you know, <laughs> we we're talking about copyrights. You were having a debate with him about intellectual property right, patents, and stuff like that. Right. And and <coughs> somebody wanted me to kind of hammer away the the point because. You know, more people need to hear this stuff. Uh, Daniel Rothschild actually, and it's not the, the Rothschilds like you're thinking. <laughs> anyway, um, his name is Daniel Rothschild. He's just a regular guy. Uh, he wants me to, to reiterate that. He um, he says he's, he's not a cigar chomper, as we call it. He's not one of the international banking conspiracy guys or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> just a regular guy. Yeah, like right. like it matters who if the guy has a top hat or not. But right. anyway, he was he was wanting to know about the difference between uh, how Rothbard identified patents and copyrights. You try to get this point across to Winslow. Hopefully, now on this show, you'll have a little bit more even uh, keel, kind of a, a chance and opportunity to explain what Rothbard really was trying to get at there, because there is a, like a duality world which is hard to understand for most people. I, I, I can see it, and I want to add in after you. But, you know, can you explain kind of how yeah. Rothbard – go ahead, go ahead. I'll let you – Yeah, and I'm not in a rush, by the way, so don't feel, don't feel rushed. Um, so first of all, I've got, an, um, I've got an, uh, a blog post I'm working on where I'm going to kind of go into this in a little bit more detail. Um, and um, I posted the other day, if you go to c4sif.org, just search for Rothbard and copyright or something, he published an article – so here's what I think. First of all, I'm not sure why it matters what Rothbard believed because we shouldn't make arguments from authority. Now, of course, he's a great – probably the greatest libertarian figure, so it matters what he thought was of interest, and maybe we can learn something from him. But um, if, he, if it turns out he was for what we would call a type of copyright or, or IP, then he was just wrong, and then we can analyze why he was wrong and where he made a mistake. Um, I think he was a little ambiguous in what he said. I think he took a stab at it. Um, I think there's different ways to interpret what he said. One way is that he was basically talking about some kind of contract, and then he analyzed in very brief detail what would happen to third parties because he, he realized that merely having a contract between two people is not sufficient to get you something similar to modern patent or copyright. Right. Those systems have to be what we call in rem property rights, good against the world. That's good against third parties. If it only binds people that sign a contract, it's not a full property right 
And so he was he tried to come up with a suggest one suggestion of a way that you could have a private contract that would somehow uh, limit what third parties could do with the information they somehow got from the second guy to the contract. So that was his argument. I think what he was arguing there was wrong. But le let me say this. In the, I think it was in the 60s um, when he first started writing on, on IP, he had a very lucid and clear um, argument against most IP, including patents. He argued that patents distort research and innovation. At best, they, they incentivize one type of R&D at the expense of another because what you can get a patent on would be a practical application of an idea, a gizmo, uh, but you couldn't get a patent on the abstract ideas, so you're going to have relatively less R&D going to this and more going to this, so it just distorts and skews the economy. So he recognized that, and he also recognized um, that it was a monopoly grant by the state. Right. And then he, he wrote this stuff about this, contra he called it contractual copyright and common law copyright. Um, I don't, Look, I think people even now are confused by this. Let me briefly explain. This copyright uh, that we think of now is a, purely a creature of statute, and it emerged from the statute of Anne in 1709, basically back in England. Um, there was a doctrine called common law copyright, but that had nothing to do with modern copyright or with the statute of Anne, or with what Rothbard himself called common law. I actually don't know what he was talking about when he said common law copyright. I think what he meant was some kind of right to prevent a copy based in a contract. I think that's right. what he meant. But the original common law copyright was almost like what we call trade secret now. Yeah. Now, again, this is inside baseball, but if you're going to have strong opinions on these things and be in favor of it, you got to know what you're talking about, and tr a trade secret is a way of preventing information from spreading beyond a small group of people if you take reasonable steps to keep it secret. So even if the information is about to go public, you can stop third parties from disseminating the information, which is, by the way, is why I'm against trade secret law too. I think it's totally unlibertarian as well because third parties, again, never agreed to any contract. But it's limited to that narrow situation. Common law copyright was similar. It was – based upon the idea that let's say you have an unpublished manuscript for a novel in, or a book in your drawer and someone takes it and they, they're about to go publish it. Well, you can get the courts to stop them from publishing it because it's not yet published. But once it becomes widely published, it's too late to put the genie back in the bottle. So the original idea of common law copyright, like the idea of trade secret, never can be used against already public information, however it became public. So it's got nothing to do with the basis of modern copyright or even Rothbard's contractual copyright idea. So he, he first wrote against patents. He took an admirable stance, and he, he wrote some good stuff on that. Then he, he kind of had some thoughts on how maybe you could have a contract that could bind third parties in it, the ethics of liberty. And then this piece you can find on my website, he published in like 1984. Um, uh, in the Libertarian Forum, where he, he starts talking about these um, all these copyright cases happening because people are starting to use VCRs to record broadcast signals. <laughs> so he's got to look at this afresh, in the, and he admits he's a technological ignoramus. He doesn't know much about technology, and he's wonder and he says, it seems to me if you broadcast a signal, you're letting it go out into the public, and you have no complaints if people copy it. So he's, you can see he's moving in the right direction. And then in 1988, or 89, I think it was 88, Hans Hermann Hoppe came over here to study under him for 10 years. And Rothbard and Hoppe and David Gordon and Leland Yeager were on a panel together at the Mises Institute. And someone asked, I think Hoppe, they said, what do you think about ownership of knowledge? which, by the way, is the assumption Rothbard uses in his Ethics of Liberty argument. He assumes that ownership, knowledge can be owned, which is why the third party is bound by this contract. That's, I think, the mistake he made, if that's what he meant. And Hoppe gets asked this question straight on. Now, this is on a panel sitting next to Rothbard, and Hoppe just right away says, knowledge can't be owned. You can use it to guide your actions, but once it gets other people learn it, they can use it as they see fit too. So he basically gave a, a flat-out Rothbardian, Misesian, proxyological, anti-IP answer just intuitively because he, he saw clearly 
um, the role that knowledge plays in human action. It's not a scarce means of action. It's knowledge that guides us. Now, to my mind, I mean, Rothbard's sitting right next to him. He didn't object. You know what I mean? So you can see the trajectory. I've talked to Hans about this. He believes, I believe, that if Rothbard had lived past 95 when the Internet began, right. there is almost no doubt in my mind that he would have corrected his sort of attempt to salvage a little bit of copyright with his ethics of liberty argument, and he would have agreed, of course, copyright and patent are completely unlibertarian and can't be justified. But yeah. even, even if that's not correct, then he would have been wrong. So that's my view. <laughs> yeah, no thought police needed, huh? <laughs> no, no, but I think it's good. And so I'm going to have a piece analyzing this in more detail. But if you just look at that Rothbard 1984 Libertarian Forum argument, uh, you'll see the direction, the anti-copyright direction he was going in. Yeah, good stuff. Stefan, it was, it's been a great show, man. I'm going to have you back on real soon. I want to give you a chance to obviously give some plugs and, and maybe some websites. Uh, if you have some events coming up, whatever you want to say, go for it. Uh, no events coming up right now, um, but uh, I'm blogging on the Libertarian Standard. That's my group blog, uh, libertarianstandard.com, and I also blog on IP and information and innovation-related areas. Um, on c4sif.org, and also I have a, a podcast, which is you know roughly weekly, um, on um, stephankinsella.com. It's called Kinsella on Liberty. Yeah, beautiful, good stuff. Well, I'm going to have you back on hopefully within the next month or two. How's that sound? Sure, I enjoyed it. I'd awesome. be happy to. Awesome, buddy. I appreciate it, man. Now have a good night. Thanks. You too. Good night. Yeah. All right. Guys, thank you guys so much for checking out Triple V. As you know, I'm going to have Ben Stone coming up tomorrow and Chris Cantwell on Saturday. And I have the whole calendar over on voluntaryvirtues.com, so if you guys want, click on in the little description section below and you guys can uh, go check out my schedule. Obviously, if you have any questions, you uh, want me to ask one of my interviewees uh, a question, go ahead and leave me a message over at shanklinmike at yahoo.com or you can find me on Facebook. Uh, there's not too many Michael Shanklins, so uh, it shouldn't be too hard to find me. And that's pretty much it for tonight, guys. I appreciate all your time, and thank you guys so much for checking out Triple V. I'll talk to you guys probably tomorrow, I hope.